Okay, so this is aerosol generation and mitigation in dental practices. It's for one live CE credit or on demand if you're watching the recording. And it's sponsored by IQ Air. I am the chief education officer here. I am an employee of Dental CE Academy. I declare no financial affiliation with our sponsor. I have not received a speaker's honorarium and no corporate entity has influenced the content of this presentation. There is our email. If you have any questions about compliance, please reach out to us through our website. Our agenda for this evening, the presentation is from five to six. And from 6 to 6.30, there will be an IQ Air product demonstration that I will actually be giving. So um, it will probably take about five or 10 minutes with any questions. It could be longer. You, it's your choice to see how long you'd like to stay, but it's excellent material for you. And we um, emphasize monitoring air quality in your dental practice. So IQ Air has a very... Um, advanced monitoring system for dental practices and it's very cost effective. So please stay on for a few minutes. It's not required for CE credit, but I'm going to zero in on that because it really is important. For CE credit this evening, attendees will log off at the conclusion of the webinar if you'd like, or you can stay on a few minutes and hear information about IQ Air. Either way, when you log out, you'll be redirected to take the quiz, okay? There's going to be a reminder email sent to you, everyone, at 635 with the link to the quiz as well. You'll need 80% minimum passing score, unlimited attempts, and seven days to successfully complete. The quiz does expire September 26th. And if you have any questions about CE credit, you can submit an online request there to us, and we'll be happy to uh, address that for you. Learning objectives are here, we're going to identify procedures at high risk for aerosol production, describe transmission precautions for aerosol generating procedures, implement administrative controls and engineering controls to reduce aerosol and discuss technologies to assist dental practices with aerosol mitigation. And we've got a few hellos here that I need to address. So thank you all, yep, bye. I hope I'm over this sooner than later. And it's, um, this is considered live CE. Yes, Myra. I'll be talking about how I think I got it, which was in a healthcare facility, by the way. Okay, potential routes of disease transmission in a dental office, direct contact with body fluids of an infected person or patient, contact with environmental surfaces or instruments that have been contaminated by the patient, and contact with infectious particles from the patient that have become airborne. And that's what we're going to focus on this evening. So when we talk about aerosol, we're talking about uh, particle size. And this is how aerosols are classified. And this is going to be on your quiz. So you do want to pay particular attention. When we talk about aerosol, we talk about the large particle size, which is spatter, greater than 50 microns. And then we talk about droplets, which are particles less than or equal to 50 microns. And then we talk about droplet nuclei, which are very small. They're evaporated droplets. And they are very light in mass. So they're less than 10 microns. Now, we're going to also talk not just about the 2.5 uh, particles, but the less than one microns. Those are ultra fine particles. And the smaller these particles get, the more deeply they embed in the respiratory tract. So large particles for this greater than five microns tend to deposit mainly in the upper and large airways, limits the aerosol that is delivered to the lung. Particles from two to five microns deposit preferentially in the central and small airways. And then your small particles, your ultra fine particles, deposit mainly in the alveoli. So very deep into the respiratory uh, tract. So let's talk about spatter. It's defined by my sick and colleagues as airborne particles larger than 50 microns in diameter. 
And when we think of a micron, that equates to one millionth of a meter, which is still pretty small, right? Now, these particles behave like ballistics, right? So when we're working on a patient, if spatter is ejected from that patient's oral cavity while we're working, say maybe it's a high speed handpiece, that spatter is usually attached to other, you know, organic material and non-organic material. It's going to bounce around um, in our facility, probably in the operatory at first, until it runs out of steam. So it will bounce off the walls, maybe your face mask, your hair, or if you have your hair cup covered, hopefully, uh, your hair bonnet, um, the walls, etc., ceiling until it runs out of steam and lands somewhere, gravity is going to bring it down. Now, when you think of ballistics and you think of physics, the trajectory is like an arc. So if this large particle, the spatter was ejected, you know, outside in a field somewhere, it's going to behave like shooting a cannon out of a cannon or cannonball out of a cannon or a bullet. But because it's in a confined space, it's going to bounce around, all right? So there's no telling where it's going to land, but eventually the gravity is going to bring it down. So they're too large to become suspended in the air. So they're airborne only briefly. And again, if you have any questions, please be sure to ask me um, anything. You can type it into the chat area. If you don't have the handout, please take a look in the chat area, I'm going to repost that for you. And for those of you watching the recording later, just refer to the website page, you'll see the handout download and the quiz. Okay, aerosol and spatter. So droplets, we're going to talk about now. Droplets are smaller than spatter. We said that they are less than 50 microns and they can remain suspended in the air until they eventually evaporate. And when they dry up, they leave these droplet nuclei that contain a concentrated amount really of bacteria. And oftentimes those bacteria are related to respiratory infections. Okay, so droplets again, light in mass, usually you have something clinging to them like some organic matter or something. They're very small, less than 50 microns. The droplet nuclei can contaminate surfaces in a range of three feet, and they may remain airborne for 30 minutes to several hours. And that's because they are very light in mass. And again, they're usually quite pathogenic. Now, the issue with droplet nuclei, the ultrafine particles, they can actually remain suspended for quite some time because the mass is so light. And the issue we have in our dental practice is this aerosol doesn't just stay in the operatory, right? When we think of aerosol, we're going to think of zones. We're going to think of the zone closest to the patient's face. So that's probably where we're going to really be um, our face mask and so forth when in close proximity to the patient's face will be um, sprayed with spatter and droplets. And then we have a zone in the operatory about six feet or greater that we need to address and the, of course, the, the air quality and then the air quality of the entire practice because these droplets and droplet nuclei don't just stay in the operatory. They can be picked up by a microcurrent and taken really anywhere in your, your operatory. So bottom line here is that in a dental practice, our practices are procedural, right? Everything we do when we perform a procedure on a patient just about generates some form of aerosol. Even our examinations, we're using a three-way air water syringe, for instance. When you go to a primary care physician, that doctor is going to walk in the room. They're going to sit about 15 feet away from you now, and they are going to ask you a couple of questions. They're going to enter some notes into a laptop, order some labs, order some uh, prescriptions perhaps, and they call it a day, right? The only aerosol they're worried about here 
is aerosol that's generated with conversation, tidal volume breathing, and if the patient has a cough or sneeze, like me today, right? So those are the three things. But in our dental practices, everything is aerosol generating, just about every procedure. So we should have an air of caution because we are in an occupation that can potentially um, put us in danger if we don't protect our airways with PPE and air quality management, air filtration. All right, so the problem here is if inhaled, the droplet nuclei can penetrate very deeply into the respiratory system. Very, very small, the ultrafine particles. Now, when this happens, um, there are some things in play that can uh, render the host or the patient more susceptible to developing an infection. And what are those? Well, virulence. How virulent is this virus or bacteria, for instance? All right. Not all viruses are created equal. Not all bacteria are created equal. We know that the newer variants of COVID, Omicron, and now the latest ones, um, they carry a much greater virulence, right? They can infect uh, our patients or ourselves quite robustly because they can um, very quickly cause infection. Dose, we're going to talk about dose, pathogenicity of the microorganisms, which really leads to virulence and then host immunity. Okay, so now this is a just a great um, diagram of how aerosol is born, basically, and how it can transmit infection. And note that when an infected patient enters your practice, and they don't always know that they're ill, right? They can be shedding virus, and, and this is pertaining to viruses specifically, but it can certainly pertain to bacteria as well. Um, these patients can shed virus. They may not know they're ill or they may be recovering. They may be what is called convalescent carriers or they're not showing clinical signs and symptoms yet of infection. So they can shed virus, not just in the respiratory discharge, but also fecal discharge. You might say, well, Dr. Rowling, why are we worrying about fecal discharge in the dental practice? It is called what? Indirect contamination, right? Indirect contact. So patients may not wash their hands. You may not be washing your hands. And those that contamination may occur on a surface in your practice, a countertop, the dental chair, etc. And you may turn on a handpiece later or walk by or your HVAC kicks in and it can re-aerosolize these shedded viruses and contamination, all right? So when we talk about, in the center here, we're talking about droplet nuclei. Again, those are the very small particles, less than five microns. And um, they tend to stay um, lingering in the air for quite some time. But we know that the hands are the number one mode of transmission for direct and indirect contact, not just your patients. So there are some of you, I think, that may be requesting your patients to wash their hands when they come into the operatory. Very good practice, by the way. You all should be washing your hands before you put your gloves on and when you take your gloves off. I was in a medical clinic hospital to be exact a few days ago and not one nurse washed their hands when they came in to administer anything not one i was pretty shocked by that you know dentistry seems to be held to a much higher standard they were using keyboards um etc and they would just grab two gloves with their dirty hands put the gloves on and they'd come um 
over to see me and I had to ask them to wash their hands. So we have to be very worried about hospital acquired infection, right? Which didn't help me much at the end of the day. But again, um, I was really kind of taken aback by that. Like what's happened to our healthcare system that we don't wash hands anymore. Now, the larger uh, particles, right? The spatter travel longer distances. Again, they act like ballistics. And if you have a susceptible individual that comes into contact with this virus who has no immunity against it, they could very well become ill, depending on the type of virus. We'll see that some viruses just aren't that infectious and some are quite infectious. So the fecal to oral route um, is a concern. In um, healthcare settings, it's particularly a concern because you have toilets, many of you, in your facility. And when that toilet is flushed, we're gonna see a video, it ejects an immense amount of aerosol into your practice. And the amount of that aerosol, or the, the majority of that aerosol would contain fecal um, type of bacteria and viruses. So when I talk about fecal to oral route, I'm talking about norovirus, the cruise ship virus. That's a virus that sometimes can wipe out nursing homes. My daughter, before she became a nurse, was a, a CNA in two nursing homes and norovirus would routinely come through there. She would get very ill and I would quarantine her away from the rest of the house when she was living with me. And then what they would do is they would put them back into uh, caring for patients if they already had that particular strain of norovirus. So she was in the ward taking care of all the patients with norovirus after she had it. Okay, aerosol source is from what? In our dental practice, it would be dental instrumentation, saliva, respiratory sources, dental hand pieces, ultrasonic scalers, air water syringe, and of course, in concert with the patient's saliva. The oral cavity has over 700 potential pathogens and bacteria from the respiratory tract, including the nasopharynx and the lower pulmonary system. And it may include gingival cravicular fluid, tooth preparation, and dental materials that have all become aerosolized. We heard early on in the pandemic quite a bit about ultrasonic scalers and um, the dental hygiene community, of course, rightfully very concerned about the aerosol emitted by ultrasonic scalers, such as this um, study test demonstrated here that the highest concentration of small droplets in zones Nearest the patient, less commonly up to eight feet away. Particle sizes were consistent with those carrying infectious agents. And these are small particle sizes. These are uh, droplet size. Mitigation here, protection should emphasize regions nearest to the procedure, so the patient's mouth, including personal protective equipment and the use of evacuation devices. If you haven't taken my infection control course, this is something I bring up. If you're chair side with your patient using an ultrasonic scaler or whatever you're using, you really need to be using a disposable gown that covers your arms. You should be covering your hair. You should be covering your shoes, all right? Arms should be covered because when we're talking about these ultra fine particles, your arms are getting covered uh, with pathogens or potential pathogens and you're not washing your arms up to your elbows. And even if you did, it's not a very um, effective way to protect yourself, right? So you're not doing a full surgical scrub between hygiene patients. So it's a very, very good idea that you cover um, your arms with the disposable gown and that your gloves are over the elastic cuff of that gown. Okay, so data, data here, these, this is concerning high-speed handpieces. Data here demonstrated that all four dental procedures 
um, in this particular study generated splatter droplets and aerosol contamination at 120 centimeters away from the source, so the oral cavity. And among those four um, aerosol generating procedures, and this is gonna be on your quiz, high speed hand pieces generated the most contamination. Electric hand pieces do not. Electric hand pieces are safer. So when we're using high speed hand pieces, we should be using precautions to reduce the aerosol that is generated, which we'll talk about. Um, and that includes, as we'll see, rubber dam when we can, um, extra uh, uh, vacuum, extra oral vacuum or suction, intraoral vacuum and so forth. So it's a quick video that I'm gonna show you. This is the University of Minnesota and these researchers tested several filtration devices. This was in a study that they were looking to increase health safety in dental offices during the COVID-19 pandemic. <clears throat> and I hope they're still using it. This video first demonstrates the aerosols and splatter released during an ultrasonic scaling procedure on a dental mannequin and it shows how this was mitigated with an extra oral local extractor filtration device. So let me go ahead and bring that up for you. Now, you have the link here. You may not be able to hear it. So they used a laser here um, to sort of identify and light up this aerosol. And what you'll see is they turn on the extra oral vacuum, whatever they call it here. And um, it will completely almost eradicate all of it. Okay, here we go. And the link is there for you. There might be a couple of you that can't see or hear this, but um, <clears throat> it's there for you. So both are on, three, two, one. Um, there, there are various extra oral suction devices out there. We're going to be showing you one this evening. If you stay on for a few minutes, that is manufactured by IQ air and, um, they're really highly recommended because the more you can bring down, uh, that aerosol to baseline, that means you're not going to have this hanging around in your air. All right, low speed hand pieces research here concluded in this study that the use of the electric drill, again, you're going to see that on your quiz, rather than an air drill or air driven, led to a 99.98% reduction in aerosol spread of the virus into the air. When they added an evacuation device, there was no detectable virus on surfaces or in air samples taken six to 10 minutes afterwards. And the results showed that by replacing high speed hand pieces with lower speed electric hand pieces, aerosol spray was virtually eliminated and it created a safer environment for the patients and the staff. Now, 
when I first started in dentistry, I was a registered dental assistant. And that was a time we didn't wear PPE. We didn't cover our face. We didn't cover our eyes. Uh, we routinely got conjunctivitis. It was just considered part of the job. And even though that sounds pretty terrible, we didn't wear gloves, we were using much lower speed hand pieces. And um, oftentimes some of the practices I was in, they were still using belt driven hand pieces. So they didn't um, generate as much aerosol as we have today because of the technology that we have. Now, if any of you are using air polishing, there's been a concern about the aerosol cloud that is generated during um, air polishing. And the concerns included infection control, potential systemic effects, um, contamination of the environmental surfaces with the sodium bicarb powder. If you've ever, water and patient generated material, organic material, if you've ever um, been in a practice that uses air polishing, which I love, sometimes you'll feel, right, a fine coating of this bicarb powder. This mist is on everything. That's not a good sign because you're probably inhaling it too. So this was an in vitro study and they evaluated an aerosol reduction device designed for use during air polishing and the results, the mean contamination without the aerosol reduction device was 175.59 centimeters squared of contamination. And the mean contamination with the aerosol reduction device with the aerosol reduction device was 4.37. So that was greater than 97% reduction in aerosol contamination. So to me, that's a no brainer. Anytime you can enter some device that's going to reduce your aerosol by 97%. So the aerosol reduction device significantly decreased the contamination produced during air polishing. Okay, the air water syringe here, bacterial counts indicate that airborne contamination is nearly equal to that of ultrasonic scalars. So a high volume evacuator will reduce the airborne bacteria by nearly 99%. What about lasers? I know there's probably a few of you in here using lasers and the issue with laser is that the laser plume, also ultrafine particles, can disperse low risk and high risk um, bacteria and viruses. Now, in this case, this study was low risk and high risk HPV DNA. What did they look at? They know that gynecologists that remove HPV associated lesions will use sometimes a laser or electrosurgery or cryosurgery, which creates plume and they were not protecting their airways and they were not using any sort of evacuation and they developed matching HPV from the surgical smoke and they were able to genotype so that they could prove that it was actual HPV lesions that they removed and the corresponding uh, tissue that was treated was such. So infectious diseases caused by aerosol, person to person, of course, these are just a few, rhinovirus, tuberculosis, influenza, Legionnaire's disease, SARS-CoV-1 and 2, and other bacterial and viral diseases. And when we talk about vulnerability of a host, we talk about, as we said, the infectivity of the virus. And infectivity and virus shedding is important because it refers to its ability, the virus that is, to initiate infection of a host cell with production of viral progeny. Viruses are pretty simple. They are here to survive. And when there's a mutation that becomes advantageous for them, that mutation takes off. And we've seen this over and over again with SARS-CoV-2. When we talk about ID50, 
Okay, that's the infectious dose 50. It's the smallest number of infectious particles that will lead to infection of 50% of an exposed population. And it depends on what? The species, the age or the race of the host, the receptor, the immune and nutritional status of the host or host tissues, and the portal of entry of the virus. It's the minimal infective dose. Now, in the case of most viruses, only a percentage of those infected actually develop clinical illness. Those who remain asymptomatic represent subclinical cases of the infection in whom the virus may still replicate and be released into the environment. We're talking about carriers, right? So they're asymptomatic. They can walk in your dental practice. They check everything off is just great on their health history haven't been sick at all, and they have COVID, and they don't know it. They don't feel sick, and they are shedding virus and so forth. Okay, so exposure to as low as one infectious viral particle has a probability of causing an infection leading to disease but that probability is going to vary from virus to virus, as we said. Infectious doses, as we spoke of earlier, are derived and reported in units of 50% infective dose values. So that reflects the dose capable of infecting half of the subjects exposed. So one in 10 infectious aerosolized Ebola virus particles, for instance, can cause an infection in humans. One particle. That's pretty amazing when you think about it. We walk around, we don't think about what could be in the environment. One in 10, are we immune to Ebola? No, we're not immune to Ebola. Um, unless we've had it before. Um, compared to inf influenza virus infectivity values specific to H5N1 and H7N9 strains, are not available. However, they've estimated that it's probably 100 to 1,000 infectious viral particles that have been reported. And not surprising, SARS-CoV-2 is thought to have very low ID50 values. So once infected with one of these viruses during its prodromal period before one shows symptoms or when the symptoms become clinically um, significant, the infected individual may become a shedder of infectious particles. And that is why the infection control that you have, the protocol in your practice is so important. Because what you're really worried about are the carriers. The people that look sick, we can't cherry pick patients. It's the patient that looks perfectly healthy and someone has decided to let their guard down, right? Right now we have a situation where we have people walking around with COVID, right? Um, they don't get tested because the they may not have symptoms yet, or the symptoms may be mild, or the symptoms may be that of allergies or a cold or something. And you aren't going to know who's walking in your practice with a COVID infection, right? So we have to have protocols in place to protect ourselves, our patients, and our family members at home. Because anything that we come into contact with in terms of our day in aerosol that might be clinging to our clothes or our shoes or our hair if we're not covering our hair or our forearms we're taking home with us. So if you're picking up your child and giving a big hug or hugging your husband or your wife, et cetera, or getting in your vehicle, you potentially are causing cross-contamination. Now, disseminating disease depends upon a few factors, the amount of virus released, so shed, uh, infectivity of the virus within the released matrix, so droplets in the aerosol, or as we said, fecal, di uh, fecal diarrheal discharge, other excretions, so including respiratory secretions. And then, of course, the survival of the released virus. Not all viruses are going to last very long in the environment. 
remember early on with SARS-CoV-2, we were hoping that when the summer came around, it would behave like other good viruses and die off because of the heat, but we didn't have that sort of luck, right? Okay, and um, now this was the XBB15, the Kraken variant. And I just put this here so we can think about it a little bit. It's, why is it so contagious? Well, this was a virologist in Seattle, and he suggested that Omicron subvariant here, XBB15, had a reproduction number of around 1.6. So that meant every person infected by this variant on average will go on to infect about another 1.6 other people. The mechanism behind its increased transmissibility hasn't been determined, but it's thought to be a mutation of the spike protein, no big surprise there, that permits that virus to more effectively latch on to ACE2 receptors. Where are ACE2 receptors found in the body? All cell surfaces, organs, etc. So the doorway through which the virus gets into cells in our noses, throats, throats and lungs. And this one happened to be much more virulent than the prior variants. Of course, that was about six variants ago. Okay, virus survival on fomites via aerosol. What are fomites? Fomites are inanimate objects. Um, an example would be the dental chair, the um, your countertop in your operatory, uh, your front office, uh, reception area, chairs, any inanimate object. And it's important uh, to consider when you're assessing risk, the survival, again, the continued infectivity of these viruses on these environmental surfaces or in the air in the form of droplets and aerosol, which is why we're here this evening. So healthcare facilities and settings should use engineering and work practice controls to reduce worker exposure to generated aerosols to the best extent feasible. And this is going to be on your quiz. So administrative controls, we reduce the risk and administrative controls are always placed at the top in the hierarchy of all of our controls above engineering. You all are the experts at administrative controls. Administrative controls early on in the pandemic, what did you do? You had the patient waiting out in the car, they would text you when they got there. Um, they, you would take their temperature, you would have them uh, complete a, an extended uh, health history. Did they travel anywhere? Have they tested positive for COVID, yada, yada. Now, but you can apply it to other issues, all right? So I'll give you an example. I was working in a public health department treating children, very busy clinic in an annex, um, and uh, they brought in an emergency for me because I had a failed appointment. And that patient had rabies shots. The patient had been bitten by a bat. It was a homeless person. Now, he just happened to be at the lab next door. There was no emergency with this patient, right? Do Is this someone that we want to be treating that day? Probably not. Um, they're in the middle of a series of rabies shots. Um, we had another one with tuberculosis. So the administrative controls in that clinic failed. They brought the patient to the back. They had the patient sit out in the front, the tuberculosis patient, active TB, filling out a form and brought them to the back, et cetera. You know, this is a risk. So what you're trying to do is reduce risk. You're trying to reduce risk by not even letting them hit in the practice essentially. Okay, engineering controls. We're going to use devices and protocols to mitigate risk. All right, what would those be? Rubber dam, HVAC, extra oral scavenging devices, UVC defoggers, pre-procedural rinses, and more. Any questions? Again, I wanna remind anybody that joined us late, and I'm going to repost these instructions because they're going to be lost. If you don't have the, the um, handout, be sure that you have downloaded here or check your email.
Okay, so the efficiency here of an extra oral scavenging device on reduction of splatter contamination during dental aerosol generating procedures. This was an exploratory study. And it resulted in, these devices resulted in 20% reduction in frequency and 75% reduction in mean intensity of contamination of operatory sites. There was a 33 and 76% reduction in mean intensity contamination for the clinician and the assistant re respectively. Using a rubber dam and four-handed dentistry resulted in further reduction. Okay, now engineering controls, um, we're gonna talk again about extra oral suction. Using the extra oral suction unit during a dental procedure, these simulations uh, showed that droplet spatter was reduced at the dentist eye level, as well as the level of the simulated patient's mouth. They were kind of using um, typodonts, you know. When the extra oral suction unit was used at level 10 and four inches from the simulated patient's mouth, they noted less spatter was detected. So this particular study, they concluded that extra oral suction units are an effective method of reducing droplet spatter during operative dental procedures, and they can be useful in helping reduce risk of experiencing COVID-19 spread during dental procedures. Let me go back one here. Okay. So what about UVC light? I get quite a few questions about UVC light during our infection control course. And the infection control course, the next live course will be next Saturday, the 30th. We offer it twice a month, two Saturdays. So if you need infection control, please go ahead. Um, if you're from California, you will get three units, but it will not apply to California's mandate for bloodborne pathogens. It's not state specific, it's general. Um, far UVC light, okay. UVC light actually has been around for quite some time. And it's a course that I present uh, about once a quarter. And for our dental practices, it's considered a newer tool to help control the spread of airborne mediated microbial diseases. Understand that not all UVC germ germicidal light is equal. Okay, the, the um, devices should be FDA cleared, number one, and they should state to you what they claim to kill. Now, you'll see that there are some devices that look like little toaster ovens, and you can put your uh, cell phones in there and um, iPads and so forth, and those are great. However, if they only kill a few bacteria or viruses or they're not used properly, of course, um, they're not going to be effective. So look and see. There are now robots that roam hospitals, and now some dental practices are using them as well, and that's a, a course that I give. The, the downfall of UVC lighting, there are a couple things. First of all, there are shadowing effects that can occur. Uh, UVC light is also damaging to the eye, so you do have to use it while you are not in the room. And many of them have safety switches. So if somebody walks in, it will turn off. Um, and the shadowing effect that can occur means that it's only going to reach the areas that are facing the light. So if you have something behind the light and so forth, of course, it's not going to be effective. Mask, what can I say here? I think we're all pretty much um, over it, but masks are required if you wanna protect your airways. Um, the number one thing that you need to consider about a mask is that it fits you well, okay? Now, these of course are N95s. N95s are important. However, they have to be changed with some regularity, first of all. Now, many folks will cover this with just a medical grade mask and reuse it, and that's fine. There was um, a study that came out about six months ago that this one study thought that the medical mask over top of it would create some sort of disruption in the seal of the mask. 
that was the only study I saw. And I wasn't convinced when I read the study, I wasn't convinced that it was a well-designed study. So I haven't included it here. It's important um, to understand that when you're talking about 95, N95 or CAN95, when properly fitted, it should filter out at least 95% of airborne particles, including large and small particles. It does not necessarily protect you from the very ultrafine particles, however, and fit testing is required. Some people, my um, one uh, gastroenterologist wears an N95 the entire day, and he's had COVID. He has no idea how he got it, but he requires all his patients still walking into his practice. He has set up administrative controls. He has one patient in the waiting room at a time. Why? Because he's treating patients that have Crohn's disease, uh, cancer of the uh, GI tract and so forth that are susceptible um, to the infection, right? So he's really trying to protect his patients as well, which is something we have to consider. What are we doing for our patients that are 65 and older? Are we informing them that they're at greater risk when they walk in our dental practices for aerosol? That's something we need to think about. Or our patients that are immunocompromised. All right, in our operatories, here's specific applications that we're going to look at by room or area. So operatories here, we can use intraoral devices, extraoral scavenging devices, individual room filtration, HVAC, HVAC with UVC and UVC. In addition, um, we should consider reducing the objects left on the counter. So if you're a practice that has all of this stuff on your countertops, the little jars with cotton rolls, etc., get it off of there. You don't want that exposed to the aerosol. Um, keep everything behind a cabinet as best you can. And it's just a better way to be able to clean your surfaces and disinfect them as well. Right, so anything that does not need to be on your countertop, keep your gloves, of course, in a closed container, a closed dispenser, and mask not open to the aerosol. We're, again, we're talking about these particles that can be quite small. Okay, uh, when we talk about the reception area in the front desk, we should have individual room filtration. Many practices have HVAC, but some do not. Depends on your building. Um, HVAC, you can have UVC installed, and then um, extra UVC lighting. Now, I was informed by IQ Air that they have done studies where UVC in the HVAC can degrade the system. So that is something, um, if you have questions about that, reach out to IQ Air and they can explain it to you. Okay, dental laboratory. Of course, bench top filtration room filtration devices, HVAC, HVAC with UVC, and then UVC um, in addition in our restroom. So I'm gonna show you a couple of videos here about bathrooms. If you have them in your practices, it's something to think about. Definitely want room filtration devices in there. You definitely wanna make sure that there's some sort of air filtration, HVAC you might have, you might not again. Uh, UVC may be a good idea too. So this is a study. This was 2022 publication. Toilet plume, what's the risk? Flushing a toilet generates an energetic turbulent flow. It releases droplets and aerosol into the air, reaching heights in excess of 1.5 meters in scenarios that present increased risk of aerosol and fomite mediated disease transmission from feces. The largest droplets are gonna settle out within seconds. Remember, they're gonna bounce around, but those smaller particles will remain suspended and they're not going to stay in your bathroom. So the presence of pathogens on the toilet bowl sidewalls or in the bowl water contribute to the contamination of these aerosols Contamination of the bowl water can persist after dozens of flushes and bioaerosol concentrations released from a flush toilet vary 
depending on the type of toilet, the ventilation performance, the radial position around the bowl, the water supply pressure level, and the presence of fecal waste. While growth of the aerosol plume can be reduced when you close the lid, toilets we know in public or commercial or healthcare settings typically do not have lids. If you go to an airport now, they don't have lids and they have automatic flushing. So you don't even have a chance to get out of the way, right? So that's a problem. Most of the time, um, unless you had to sign up to everybody, uh, for everybody in your practice, please close the lid when you flush, but you know that's not gonna happen um, or it will happen not as often as you would like. So the risk associated with transmitting respiratory and enteric viruses, so gut viruses through the use of public toilets due to contaminated aerosols from the toilet plume, suspended aerosol from prior users or transmission via high touch surfaces should be mitigated where possible. And SARS-CoV-2 and other viruses have been shown to survive on surfaces for several days. Enteric bacteria, especially pathogenic and otherwise like C. difficile, which we have that course tomorrow evening, and other pathogens are aerosolized upon flushing and they deposit onto the local architectural surfaces in your practice. And very small particles will hang around in the air and they may not stay in the toilet. They may go out to the front office or they may go into operatory number two. I'm gonna show you a couple of videos here just to give you um, an idea. And any questions? So this is a video that um, they're, they're using lasers to light up the aerosol, similar to the other one. And that didn't, um, and so it's lit up as green, okay? They're going to flush the toilet and you're going to see how much aerosol is produced. And again, that aerosol ranges in size from the larger particles to the very ultra fine particles, and they don't just stay in the bathroom. Somebody's going to open the um, door. Maybe you keep the door closed, that's probably a good idea. But an even better idea is to have filtration in there that's going to evacuate um, this as well. We are using lasers to look at what is ejected out of a commercial toilet when it's flushed. When the toilet is flushed, it emits these very small aerosolized particles, and they range from you know, as small as, as tenths of microns up to potentially as large of, as almost a millimeter. The very large particles fall out quickly, the smaller particles remain suspended. The laser light is being shown in a, in a, in a, in a thin sheet, and it just reflects off of those particles, and then our eyes or the cameras are able to pick them up and, and visualize them. There's obviously the ick factor, you know, the fact that you've got the stuff from the bowl that's coming up. There's a lot of studies that have shown that pathogens persist in the bowl for dozens of flushes after the pathogens are introduced. So from a public health perspective, it's, it's really important to understand this. We need to emphasize that, you know, we're not epidemiologists, we're not in public health, we're engineers and physicists. Our role is to understand the physics of this mechanism and show that that could lead to exposure of pathogens and then work ideally with other people down the road to try and understand how to minimize the transmission. I think this will change your relationship with toilets. We have a relationship with a toilet. Um, we do want to just be cognizant of that fact. And what are you doing to uh, reduce the aerosol that may be on the walls, on the floor, in the ceiling in your restroom, and, and potentially traveling down the hallway elsewhere? 
Okay. So again, um, if the toilet has a lid, that's excellent. That's a good idea. But many people don't close the lid. And um, many of these new public restrooms don't have lids on their toilets or they, and they have the auto flush. Okay. So air filtration, infection prevention, and hand sanitization is really important. Again, that's really important to uh, when your patient first comes into the practice and you're taking them to the operatory that you have them wash their hands at the sink. At least you're going to help reduce some of the cross-contamination. When we talk about aerosol, it's important as we close here to talk about dental practice design because back when I started as a dental assistant in 1981, many of the practices had individual operatories. They were fully drywalled with their own door and uh, the risk of aerosol traveling down the hallway, at least it was somewhat disrupted, right? We're using, then we were using um, belt driven hand pieces often, um, et cetera. So the aerosol was not, what I'm trying to say, was not as huge in 1981. It was still a deal, but not as huge. Now, many of the dental practices at about that time started going to open bay design, or they bought cabinetry as wall partitions. So the aerosol could travel right from operatory to operatory. So it's hard to contain that aerosol. So it makes it a challenge for air quality and aerosol containment. But there's a thought now that um, the aerosol that is generated might be better off if we all go back to these closed bay operatories. But for some of us with, all, with practices already designed and so forth, that's going to be an issue, right? Okay, MPOX, monkeypox, dental practices, of course, can reduce the spread through awareness, screening, and infection control. Um, it does have some respiratory component. It's also skin-to-skin -skin transmission. And um, we have an entire course on MPOX. Here are some resources on our website for you all. More uh, courses. The infection control that you see there will be uh, September 30th, so a week from this Saturday, offered twice a week. Tomorrow night is Clostridium difficile course. Um, hypochlorous acid, if you're not familiar with it, is an excellent disinfection uh, disinfectant to uh, eliminate a lot of the spores and so forth that cavi whites do not kill. And uh, these are all available to you at no charge. This is a course on demand now, just to let you know, um, if you are still prescribing clindamycin, it was removed from the prophylactic guidelines, uh, 2016 and 2021. So you may wanna take this course. This is Dr. Tom Palmeyer. He is the co-author of the ADA's antibiotic uh, prophylactic guidelines. Again, it's complimentary. He includes forms that you can use in your practice. It's a tremendous course, so I highly recommend it. We also have a one and a half hour course by Dr. Deborah Goff, who works in partnership with Dr. Paul Meyer on the new dental antibiotic uh, guidance. She is a clinical pharmacist and an infectious diseases expert, and she lectures all over the world. Any questions for me? We've got a question here, latest studies on hand washing versus hand sanitizers. So the CDC has recommended that um, alcohol-based hand sanitizer should be used unless we're in a situation where hands are visibly soiled. And then we're going to want to wash our hands with soap and water under a sink. Here's a couple of the issues with that. First of all, they know, the CDC, that if a facility uses alcohol-based hand sanitizer at 70%, compliance goes up. In some areas, some dental practices now don't even have sinks in them, okay? So to be able to wash your hands at chair side is, may not be a possibility. So alcohol-based uh, hand sanitizer. The problem is that alcohol-based hand sanitizer is not sporicidal. So 
One thing that we do need to be worried about in dental practices is Clostridium difficile contamination. Every healthcare setting needs to be, certainly dental practices as well. We're not immune. And we're not using disinfectants that kill C. diff spores, and the alcohol-based hand sanitizer will not kill C. diff spores. So the thinking now is that we should be washing our hands under the sink. So there's a course that I present here on effective hand hygiene, and you can get all of the information you need right there, right in the middle. Um, go ahead and take the course. It's available on demand as well. And we talk about what does it mean. And also, when you're using alcohol-based hand sanitizer, you have to use it properly, right? You can't use it like a hand lotion. Um, if it says use it for 20 seconds and your hands dry in five, you haven't used it long enough. You know, so these are some things we talk about in that course. That's a good question. Thank you, Paris. Okay, I'm going to show, yeah, we have someone here. They don't have sinks in their ops anymore. She has to use hand sanitizer. And what oral rinse do I recommend prior to cleanings? So I'm going to, Dawn, give you, do I have it on this slide? On our website, I do not. On our website, we have a course called Oral Rinses, What's Safe, What's Effective. It's presented live every month by Dr. Moskowitz, Herb Moskowitz, and it's also available on demand. And he will break down every oral rinse antimicrobial known to man, uh, the kill time, etc. Now, full disclosure, he is the chairman of IOTech International's Molecular Iodine Rinse, IORINS. And IORINS has been shown in many studies to completely um, outdo hydrogen peroxide, chlorhexidine gluconate, acetylperidinium chloride, et cetera. He goes through every one of those. So I would encourage you to take that course. It's one and a half CE units. And he will enlighten you about all of these products. Chlorhexidine gluconate is a poor antiviral. Any other questions? I'm going to bring up the IQ Air presentation here. Um, Glory, who's normally here, the CEO could not be here this evening. I'm just going to do a run through here for you. Um, IQ Air is located in Southern California. So those of you, this is promotional, so you're not required to stay, but if you wanna learn about their dental monitoring, uh, air quality monitoring system in your dental practice. And it's like, a, I think a $200 device with an app. It's going to tell you the level of air quality in your dental practice. You use it with an app. Um, and so I wanna show that to you because I think it's important to get a handle on what the air quality looks like in your practice, right? Um, so. Anyways, this is solutions for dental practices, and they really are state-of-the-art in terms of dental practice, air quality, air filtration, as well as air quality monitoring. What I'm going to do is show you a quick video here, and this is Glory. She is normally here, and she's the CEO for IQ North America, and they're international. And let me go ahead and bring up this presentation here. So this is a demonstration of the president of the company. He is in an air chamber, a smoke chamber, and they turn on their air filtration device and they show in real time how it's cleared. IQR president Frank Hammers is about to step into this specially designed chamber to personally prove the effectiveness of the IQ Air Health Pro Plus. We have two officers here to ensure the grenades are properly fired. Now obviously this is a demonstration you don't want to try at home. to release noxious smoke and chemicals into this chamber. The 
Your home can be filled with harmful fumes from household cleaners and other pollutants, but nothing compares with what we're about to release. Now Frank is sitting close to the IQ Air and will only breathe the fresh filtered air coming directly out of the Health Pro Plus. Remember, he doesn't have a gas mask. The whole chamber is now filled with noxious smoke and chemicals. Look closely, you can see Frank breathing the clean air stream coming directly from the Health Pro Plus. The IQ Air Health Pro Plus is clearing the room completely. That's a pretty good demonstration of um, how effective these devices are that they offer. Um, and of course, we just got done talking about the ultrafine particles, which are concern. So air quality really takes three steps here. Source control, we use extra oral suction, right? We wanna eliminate as much aerosol as we can before it has the ability to um, get out and contaminate our air and our operatories and the rest of our practice. Good ventilation um, and air cleaning, recirculation. They offer here a clean air facility uh, certification. And this is important, your patients will see a high, higher level of compliance and care. So um, this is a facility, I believe this was an ortho practice in Southern California. And this is their uh, facility, the clean air facility. And what they look at is outdoor, and indoor air quality, indoor air quality, 100% cleaner than the outside. And their device, because you can um, let your patients see this when they come in your practice, you can have it up on your TV monitors and so forth, where it will come up and they can see what the air quality is. And it's kind of interesting because you can take the monitor and I'll show it to you from room to room during particular procedures and see how much aerosol you're actually generating. All right, so this is uh, Dr. Kelly Blodgett and through the Clean Air Facility Program, air cleaning specialists verify that your facility is providing staff and patients with clean air. Their dental sites achieve over 90% reduction in particulate matter. So they use demand-based filter replacement schedules and air filtration. So again, source control on the photo on the left, and this handout is in your course folder, by the way, too. We see the extra oral scavenging device, right? This is the FlexVac that they offer with either the Dental Pro or the Health Pro Plus system. So you can capture aerosols right at the source, right where you're performing the procedure. And then the FlexVac here, aerosols can be captured at the source as well. So waiting rooms where patients and staff may congregate and can be exposed to aerosolized biological contaminants that remain airborne indefinitely. So rule of thumb, extra oral suction is the key. They believe you place one air purifier with extra oral suction in each operatory or have at least one for each dentist and hygienist that can be rolled around the practice that would be the dental or the health pro model with extra oral suction. If there is access to the HVA system, not all practices have access to their HVAC. They have really interesting, it's called Nanomax filtration technology that can be installed. Again, it's very cost effective as well. And um, it does not put extra load on your HVAC. And then finally, place an adequate amount of air purifiers in the waiting room for recirculation. 
and they um, advise one health pro plus per 1150 square feet or less. So the Nanomax HVAC, the, L the air filtration exceeds MERV 16 particle filtration without the load on the system. So it's a really very um, effective filtration system. All right, so this is what I really want you to see, the Air Visual Pro and Air Visual Outdoor monitoring platforms. You wanna know your air. So with the Air Visual series, you will know what your indoor and outdoor air quality monitoring is. The air visual platform gives you access to historical real-time and forecast air pollution data outside, seven-day air pollution and weather forecasts and health recommendations, and you can link the air quality monitors to all connected building, building management systems. Um, you can set up air quality alerts for mobile devices and web-based uh, dashboards, display the data from monitors, and receive data output reports to know average indoor and outdoor of the very fine particles as well as um, carbon dioxide, as well as temperature, humidity, and performance. And if you go to iqair.com, and here they are, um, you can reach out to them and they're happy to give you a consult over the phone. If you're in Southern California area, I believe they're in Irvine, you can actually go to their facility. Any questions or comments? All right, everyone. Well, thank you so much for being here. Um, be sure to stay on. I'm going to transfer you to um, the test right now. So those of you that want help getting the link, you either have to log out so they know you've left, Ashley, or I'm going to send you there right now. All right. Thanks so much for being here. And again, tomorrow evening is the Clostridium Difficile course. Here comes the quiz.